About uh, three, four uh, years ago, no, longer than that, six or seven years ago, I, um, I, I preached through the book of Romans uh, once. It uh, probably took me two and a half years. But over the last 20 years, I've not been, I, I've not been in a position where a, a series that would last for two and a half years was, was appropriate. And uh, I, I was the evening preacher at first... Uh, Presbyterian Church in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and that meant uh, typically shorter, sh thank you, shorter series uh, than, um, than two and a half years. And then uh, Ligon Duncan, uh, who was the senior minister, uh, took a sabbatical, which lasted for three months. And I had a three-month window to preach something in the mornings consecutively. And I thought, this is, this is the opportunity not to do the whole book of Romans, but to do Romans 8. And I called it um, the best chapter in the Bible. That was the title of the series, the best chapter in the Bible. And after the first sermon, a deacon, there's always a deacon, a deacon pulled me aside um, at the end of the service and, and, and sort of had a go at me. And he said, um, I object to this title. Uh, you know, and at first I thought he was kind of joking and then realized, oh no, he's deadly serious. Because I was calling into question the inerrancy of Scripture, that all Scripture is the best chapter in the Bible. And I said, look, chill. <laughs> I said, you've got, um, you've got two minutes to live. You're, you're in a hospital, doctors come in, you're going to die in two minutes. And I'm, I'm the pastor, I'm there beside the bed, and I, I'm going to read to you some Scripture. Where do you, where, where do you want it to come from? The first eight chapters of Chronicles, which is a list of names, or Romans 8, and the clock is ticking, you now have 1 minute 45 seconds. And it's a no-brainer, it's, it's Romans 8. It begins with uh, no condemnation, there is therefore now no condemnation, and it ends in verse 35 with no separation. Because of our status in Christ and in the gospel, there is no condemnation. That's what Paul has been arguing for in the first seven chapters. We are law keepers and covenant keepers in Christ, in the gospel. There is nothing that can rise up and condemn us. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, God will see only perfection. He'll see the righteousness of Christ, the imputed robe of Christ's righteousness. That's what He sees. It's one of the most um, beautiful statements in all of Scripture. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus. Uh, one of the telltale signs that this is Paul, union with Christ. I sometimes ask my uh, seminary students, you know, if you, if an archaeologist uh, digging in the sands of Palestine somewhere, in Syria somewhere, uh, uncovers, uh, more likely in Asia Minor, in Turkey, but uncovers um, one of the lost letters of Paul to the Corinthians. You know, we've got first and second Corinthians, but there's probably a third and a fourth, and there may even be a fifth, because when he writes the first one, he's already written a letter, and then in between one and two, he refers to another letter 
that's not number one. So there are at least four letters that he wrote, and only two of them survived, and they're part of the canon of Scripture. But supposing, just supposing, an archaeologist were to find one of these lost letters, how would you know that it was Paul? Well, one of the things you'd look for is the telltale signature, en Christo, in Christ. Where did, where did Paul get that? Well, you might say from the Holy Spirit, true. But, but from a human point of view, where did Paul get that? And I, I think he got that on the Damascus Road. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was persecuting Stephen. He had been writing letters of consent for the killing of men, women, and children. This is Paul. But in effect, what he learnt on that Damascus road was, you lay a finger on one of mine, and you lay a finger on me, because they are an extension of me. They are in me, in Christ. I think that's where Paul, Paul would never forget. I, I, I don't think Paul went to bed at night without, well, without thinking of what he had been, of what he once was. And so it's, it's doubly amazing that he can write here in Romans 8, 1, There is, that, there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. What's Romans 8 about? And let, me, let me fly over Romans 8 with you. It begins with a section that calls for practical, observable, tangible, measurable, quantifiable holiness and godliness on our part as gratitude for the gospel that we have received in Jesus Christ. So he talks about, he talks about, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And I think Paul is saying that as a result of our believing in Jesus Christ, as a result of our faith union with Jesus Christ, that manifests itself with outward works of righteousness, sanctification. Sanctification that's observable and measurable and quantifiable the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, in the law-gospel debate, it's not a new debate. It's a debate that has taken place in every century since the first century. It was a debate at the heart of Augustine's writings. It was a debate at the heart of medieval Catholicism. It was a debate at the heart of the Reformation. It was a debate at the heart of Puritan theology in the 17th century. It was a debate at the heart of Scottish Presbyterian theology in the Marrow controversy in the 18th century in Thomas Boston and so on. It's at the heart of many a debate today. What is the relationship between law and gospel? And one of the things that Paul seems to be making very clear here is that as a result of our no condemnation, there is a righteous requirement of the law that is now manifested. It is the quantifiable, measurable, visible, tangible obedience on our part as those who believe the gospel. Works of righteousness, works of holiness in gratitude for the gospel. There's, it's a clear call to godliness. You notice this extraordinary sentence, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Paul is he's walking a knife edge. If he, if he had said, and we're in verse 3, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
Supposing he had dropped the word likeness. By sending his own son in sinful flesh, that would have made Jesus a sinner. What if he had said, in the likeness of flesh? Now, that might have implied that Jesus didn't have a real human body, as the Docetists uh, were saying. And there were those in the first century. John, for example, says in his first epistle uh, that he who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is, is Antichrist. And so, Paul is, ri- is, is, is writing here on a, on a theological tightrope because he wants to say on the one hand that Jesus is human in every conceivable way, a human mind, human affections, human psychology, a human body, and yet without sin. As close as possible as he can get to our condition without sinning, the second Adam to the rescue came. And then in Romans 8, 13, let's drop down to verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In 1974, 1974, uh, over 40 years ago, I picked up John Owen's um, volume 6 of his collected writings on the mortification of sin. Uh, many, many different publications of that have, have, have been made, some of it more condensed, some of it in modern English and so on. It's volume, it's part, it's half of volume six of his collected writings on the mortification of sin. John Owen was the vice-chancellor of Oxford University uh, in the 1650s, and uh, these were sermons that he delivered to what would then have been uh, boys, there would have been no girls at Oxford University, Uh, there would have been boys, and you entered Oxford University in the 1650s when you were 12. So typically the average age of his audience for these sermons were was probably somewhere around 15 or 16 years of age. I didn't realize that when I first read it, that he was actually speaking to teenagers, because they, they certainly read as though he's speaking to adults. Kill sin, or it'll kill you. Kill sin or a part of a sin every day. The need to put sin to death, to crucify it, to show it no mercy. Um, John Owen uh, uses very violent language, and he talks about, about putting your hands on the throat of sin and holding it until it doesn't move anymore. Uh, Many of us have um, a memory of when we read John Owen's mortification of sin. We go back to verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And John Owen wrote another treatise on the duty of being spiritually minded, and it's based on that fifth verse in Romans 8, the duty of being spiritually minded. In 1975, uh, I graduated from college. I was beginning seminary in Britain, and and then I would transfer to the United States to finish my seminary education. And uh, I lived in, in the manse of Jeff Thomas. Jeff Thomas was the minister of Alfred Place Baptist Church in Aberystwyth in Wales. He was a graduate of Westminster Seminary in the middle of the 1960s. And I lived in the manse for a year as a, as a seminary student. And he decided, uh, I've probably been in the, there for maybe a month or so, he decided it would be a very good idea if the two of us were to get up early in the morning, 4.30, and read John Owen's 
on the duty of being spiritually minded. I'm not a morning person. I don't like communication first thing in the morning. I, I kind of grunt. My wife likes a cup of tea in bed in the morning, but we don't communicate. Uh, it's all done by sort of rote, and there's a pattern, and things happen, and there are nods, and, and there are occasional grunts, but there's, uh, there's absolutely no communication. Currently, there is a dog that sleeps on the bed. It goes out the door, comes back in again. F I feed the two dogs. I don't speak to them, because as soon as they've eaten, they go back to sleep. Reading John Owen on the duty of being spiritually minded at 4.30 in the morning was a chore, but I will never forget it. I'll never forget the one question that he asked in that book, which has remained with me over the last 40 years. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything in particular? What's the default setting of your thought world? What do you gravitate to when you're kind of in cruise control in your mind? That's a test. John Owen said that's a test of whether you're spiritually minded. Does your mind gravitate by default into spiritual thoughts? It's a very challenging… Uh, it's volume seven of his collected uh, writings. Then let me drop down to uh, verses 26 and 27, and, and we're, we're passing over a great deal in Romans 8, but in verses 26 and 27, uh, there's a section here on the Holy Spirit. And he asks, likewise, and he says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray uh, we, we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, there's an exegetical and theological um, question as to whether the groaning of the Spirit is something… Does, is it the Holy Spirit who groans, or is it we by the Holy Spirit who do the groaning? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his, in his 14, 15 volumes of sermons on… on uh, Romans is, is, is very insistent. The Holy Spirit does not groan, he said. Well, th that, that needs to be sorted. <laughs> but it's this verb, the Spirit helps us. It's a five-letter word in English. In Greek, it is sunanti lambanatai. It, it's a big word, and it's a word that Paul has made up. The lambanatai is the verb, but he's, add, he's added two prepositions, a bit like German. But you keep on adding bits to the front of the word. And, and he uses two prepositions that on the surface look directly opposite. Sun meaning with and anti meaning opposite. So the Spirit is with us and He's opposite us. He's with us and, and not with us. Sun anti lambanatai. It's a fascinating word. I remember um, somewhere in the 1980s, uh, we moved into a house in Belfast in Northern Ireland uh, where I was a minister for 18 years, and somebody left me a piano. I don't, I don't play the piano, but my daughter was uh, in her early teens, and, and she would eventually learn to play the piano and, and, and play it well, and this was our first piano. It was an old piano. It had woodworm in it. Didn't know that until I actually brought it into the house. And, but it was an upright piano uh, on, made with a steel frame. It was heavy. It was a brute. And I thought, deacons. <laughs> That's what deacons are for. So I got the six deacons that we had and uh, said, uh, uh, I've got a job for them to do, and it was to lift this piano and bring it into my front room, and there would be dessert. <laughs> and uh, to get into the front door, you had to go up three steps, turn, go up another couple of steps, and into the front door. It was tight, it was awkward, and it's a piano, and it's heavy. 
And uh, the deacons, most of them were fairly young and, and beefy. And um, I remember being there. I can, I can still see myself holding part of this piano. And then I can remember myself sort of letting go <laughs> and thinking, yeah, this works. It, it's still moving. <laughs> and all I need to do is grunt and groan a little, but actually I'm, not, I'm really not doing much at all. Was it, was it me or was it them or was it, or was it both? And I think that's what Paul is saying, that the Spirit in our infirmities. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's us. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The extraordinary ministry of the Holy Spirit helping you when you're at the end of yourself, when you're groaning, when all you can do is groan. You ever been in the place where all you can do is groan? Do you have a trial in your life? You, you've rationalized it, you've thought about it, you, you don't know what to say anymore. Lord, I don't even know what to say anymore. And all you do is a kind of groan in the Lord's presence. And the Holy Spirit can take that groan and fix it on the way up and present it as a prayer, an effectual prayer before our Heavenly Father. It's a little treasure in the middle of Romans 8. And then in verse 32, you've got the heart of the gospel. And I referred to it earlier this afternoon. In verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how shall He not also with Him freely give us all things? He didn't spare His own Son. He freely gave Him up for us all. And if, if He's given… well, if He's given the best that He has, if He's given us His treasure, what is there that He won't give you? Tell me what it is that He won't give you when He's given you His treasure, His everything, His all, His own Son. And then you've got these four questions at the end, and they all begin with a personal interrogative, who, not, not what, but who. Who can be against us? Verse 31. Uh, who shall bring any charge? Verse 33. Who is to condemn? Verse 34. Remember, it began with, there is no condemnation. Who can separate? Verse 35. Who? Who? And the answer is Satan, of course. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Uh, Dr. Beeky's address uh, an hour or so ago, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. And here's Romans 8, and it's, it, it, it climaxes in this, in this glorious peroration like a symphony, and it's coming now to its grand conclusion that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Not life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Why is this the best chapter in the Bible? Because it covers everything. It covers the whole span of the gospel. It gives us assurance that having begun a good work, He will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. It begins with no condemnation in union and fellowship with the Lord Jesus, and it ends with no possibility of separation to those who are in Christ. It calls for perseverance. 
It calls for works of sanctification, the mortification of sin, the duty of spiritual mindedness. It reassures us that along every trajectory, in every circumstance, in every set of contingencies, there's the power of the Holy Spirit when all you can do is groan, when you can't even articulate your prayer anymore. He's there helping, nudging, prompting, guarding, protecting, enriching, comforting. For me, this is the best chapter in the Bible. For me, if I have two minutes to live and I've got two minutes to speak, then I want you to read this chapter to me. I wonder if I were to ask you, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? I'm almost certain that many of you have a verse from Romans 8. You, you may have a collection of verses, but I'm almost certain that this concluding peroration of Romans 8 is among your favorite parts of Scripture. It's a treasure, and I wrote it up into a book, and it's called How the Gospel Brings Us All the Way home. It, it began life as a series of sermons, and it has perhaps that sermonic sort of feel to it. But I think of all the books that I've written, th this is my favorite one, because it points to my favorite chapter in the Bible. Now, I'm not sure I can say as as robustly as Steve Lawson said, go and buy this book. <laughs> I kind of feel self-serving. But, but I do think if you buy it and read it, it'll help you. And I do feel that if you buy and read this book, it'll help someone else that you might give this book to, particularly Christians who need a little encouragement, who need just a little bit of help. We need that little bit of gospel comfort in their lives.